Does the Ram Mandir signify the fall of the temple of Nehruvian secularism or does it announce the arrival of the Hindu Rashtra? These were questions raised by two different senior columnists, Sadanand Dhume and Shruti Kapila, different perspectives on what is indisputably a seminal moment in India's culture, contemporary history and in India's politics. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojit story. Our focus on the larger ramifications of what we saw unfold in Ayodhya continues here. Now, we have seen in the last 24 hours, thousands and thousands of devotees literally break down the barricades at the Ram Mandir, so much so that Yogi Adityanath has had to send back his top police officers and law officers to maintain some semblance of order. From the smallest village in Bihar to towns in southern India, there has been an overwhelming, overwhelming demonstration of sentimentality. Many columnists are calling this a civilizational moment. Some have called it the coming of a second republic. But there are two columnists who are going to be our newsmakers on the program today as we continue with our Ayodhya dialogues, who have two completely different perspectives, but also perhaps some areas of convergence. Shruti Kapila and Sadanand Dhume. I want to welcome both of them uh, to the program. We'll be looking at both of their columns, one in the Wall Street Journal, the other in the print, both with very, very different and extremely provocative headlines. Let me actually show both of the headlines to our audience uh, for perspective. Let me start with Sadanand Dhume. Uh, Sadanand, writing in the Wall Street Journal, uh, this is the headline of your column, Modi, Ayodhya and the Fall of Nehru's Secular Temple. Uh, you also go on uh, sharing an extract uh, from this uh, column where you basically uh, talk about why India's elites have got, in a sense, their understanding of religiosity so very wrong. Shruti, uh, Dr. Kapila, you come in with a very different perspective. You say Modi asked what next at Ayodhya and you basically said that this is a new date and a grander ritual for an official Hindu state is all that remains to be done. You argued that uh, Ram and uh, ritual, uh, in a sense, the way it's been manifested in Ayodhya have announced uh, in a way, the shadow arrival of uh, a Hindu state. Uh, two very different perspectives. Sadanand, um, I'll start with you. Uh, you call it the fall of uh, the temple of Nehruvian secularism. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, in some ways, that chaos continues to manifest itself in those who are invoking Nehruvian secularism even today. And those are leaders of the Congress party. They're invoking Nehruvian secularism, but they're quoting the Shankaracharyas to do so. Uh, therein uh, lies the paradox itself. But let's start with your argument. What do you think just happened here? Is this that classic disconnect between India's westernized, culturally deracinated elites and how the majority of the country feels. What did you feel when you watched what happened in Ayodhya and the Prime Minister's speech thereafter? So, you know, my argument, I mean, I'm not sure to start with, Barkha, if, you know, if, if, if Shruti and I are really uh, disagreeing on the outcome, right? Uh, maybe we have a disagreement on how we got to this place. And I, mm -hmm. I have no disagreement with, you know, the, with this, this, this broad idea that this, uh, this marks a turning point in Indian public life or that India, if not, if not a formal Hindu Rashtra, is in many ways sort of acquiring the trappings um, of a Hindu state. Certainly, it's sort of moved very, very far from the Nehruvian idea or that sort of look down on public religiosity and so on, right? We all sort of, you know, we, 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 all, we all remember uh, Nehru famously trying to discourage Rajendra Prasad from going for the Somnath Temple reconstruction, uh, re uh, inauguration and so on. So that's, uh, you know, my, my basic thesis is that, you know, what, what has happened in India is really not that dissimilar from what has happened in many post-colonial societies. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, the Princeton philosopher Michael Walzer had a very interesting book where he made the argument and he used Nehru as one of his examples, but not his only example. He, he talked about Nehru, he talked about David Ben-Gurion, and he talked about Franz Fanon in Algeria. And essentially, he made the argument that a lot of post-colonial societies were led to independence by people who were far less religious than the average of their population. And I think India is a classic case of that, right? So you had Nehru himself with a very sort of westernized background, studied at Harrow, studied at Cambridge. Um, and many of the sort of people who were in dominant positions in India, in the civil service, in academia, in journalism, and so on for decades, uh, were people who I would characterize as 
far less religious than the average Indian, right? I mean, I'll just sort of, I mean, you and I have known each other for years and we just sort of have, you know, so many friends in common. Um, I would argue that the people who we grew up with and the people who we, uh, you know, have, have, have known over the decades most closely uh, were very unrepresentative. I mean, in a, in a sense, obviously, you know, English speaking elites and so on. But I think they miscalculated the depth of religiosity of the society that they were part of. So to, to, be, to be honest, would you not include yourself and me in, in that mix of people who misunderstood or certainly uh, came from a time in India's history where our parents perhaps thought or look towards Western society, Western templates of education and equated them with modernity. It was a very Nehruvian idea of, of what modern means in, in independent India. I feel that if I hadn't become a journalist, I would have been even more deracinated. I hold myself up as an example of somebody who, who has had to struggle and navigate my way through that disconnect. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily, it's not always families, right? It's just a sort of, it's the, it's the broader milieu uh, in which you're, in, in, in which you are, are, are brought up. And I, I just don't remember even sort of knowing too many people I mean, my sort of, in, 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 in my peer group. Uh, and even the people who I knew who were kind of more drawn to the BJP and so on, um, they never struck me as being particularly religious, right? They had a sort of political idea of what Hinduism should be, but they didn't sort of strike me as being people who were, you know, really caught up in the actual act, you know, act re the religiosity of worship, right? Hmm. And this is just a process that played out in India. And you could argue in hindsight that the odds of India sort of, achieving the kind of secularism that Nehru dreamt of were all the all, odds were always stacked against it. You look around the neighborhood, look at the rest of India, look at the rest of the subcontinent, right? Uh, look at what happened in Pakistan, look at what happened in Sri Lanka with the rise of Buddhist nationalism. And so I, I would argue that the odds were always stacked against it. And then of course, in the you know, further on, we can talk about what I think of some of the blunders that the Nehruvians made. But I would just want to sort of start with that big point that the Indian elite was disconnected from the religiosity of the masses. And what we're seeing now is the, you know, in a way, uh, uh, the uh, revenge of the masses, so to speak. Revenge of the masses is a very interesting phrase, Shruti, to use in a democracy. Uh, you know, yes, democracy is not majoritarianism. Um, I, 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 I get that. Uh, but I think the suggestion here is that there is an overwhelming sentiment that has been glossed over underappreciated, um, ignored, uh, some would argue even acted against. Uh, there is certainly a, a narrative uh, in political communication terms uh, that the Hindu has been embarrassed to be a Hindu till this moment. And while phrases like Hindu Rashtra have been used often in the last week by critics of the government, including yourself, it doesn't address uh, the key central question raised by Sadanand that if you go right back to the beginning, is that where everybody got it wrong? Nehruvian secularism was a theoretical, esoteric, non-practical idea that even the Congress party could not implement. Okay, thank you. This, thank you for this. This is actually a really productive debate, but I'm going to put a couple of things in perspective. Uh, I don't think this is anything, I mean, of course it is about religiosity, but the movement was not about religiosity. It is an out and out political movement. Uh, for instance, I, on Nehru, I want to say a couple of uh, things. We can talk a little bit about how we may have got here and, and secularism. You could argue very easily, as I have done previously, that actually Nehru were lost to the Congress Conservatives in the 1950s itself. I mean, he did not get his big ticket reforms, uh, whether it was mm -hmm. a Ford bill or whether it was a Zamindari Abolition Act. Men like Pushotam Das Tandon or Rajendra Prasad actually really held sway in the Congress. But I, we'll talk about Nehru in a second. The issue is that actually um, you can also look at this kind of ambivalence in Hindutva itself. After all, the, the writer of Hindutva, of the discovery of political Hinduism, i.e. Vinayak Savarkar, is a well-known atheist. In fact, his whole point was that Hindu, the, the, the idea of the Hindu as a political entity had to be delinked from, as it were, religiosity. And you know, and you see that ambivalence in the rise of Hindu nationalism uh, itself. Uh, and the temple movement is 
tied in entirely in my view not to 500 years of history though of course it has been glossed as that but actually has everything to do with the, the 1980s and the arrival of multi-party democracy in india after all the bjp goes from two seats in 1984 to full spectrum domination in 30 years and that is a very rapid fast history uh, which is which is but which if, is the, if the baseline sentiment did not exist there would be no polit- political movement to build uh, on it i think i mean i think you know i think you know on your show i think on one of your discussions in leading up to the the temple inauguration this is something that you know an argument i've heard before that dhume is uh, presenting that there was a flaw in indian secularism that a you you, you know that that the flaw in indian secularism for sadanand is that it only represented the english educated elite on that i would like to say actually the the the, the constitution is not so much about the english educated elite it's a rights based constitution it's a constitution it's a very bold constitution you could not have had affirmative action you could not have seen the kind of social equity that india has received in the last 70 years had there not been a rights based regime secondly and it's nothing to do with english speaking elites or not after all it's it's you know it's a dra- chief draftsman was b r ambedkar yeah and But- second yeah but we'll come to secularism and secondly i mean i mean it's linked to all of it because after all it is caste mobilization but it gets the idea of secularism gets added in the 1970s but formally but, but formally, on other, formally, formally in, but on the other hand it was always a multi religious compact it was always after you know sure the, the the muslims were not given any special reservations those were taken out uh, 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 you know after after uh, after as it were partition and you had as it were a rights based regime for uh, or for as it were uh, for all indians Uh, so i think that you know you can't you know you it's not the other argument is the argument that swapandas gupta made repeated on your uh, podcast the other day which is to say that actually you know secularism demanded the withdrawal of hindus in public life for as it were other communities to express themselves religious mm-hmm. now i think that has been a very kind of persuasive argument that this was called, called you know this is what advani called uh, pseudo secularism right i mean this yes. is today we don't call it that today it's straight up hindu first politics but initially the 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 political uh, uh, demand for the ram temple was actually made what sadanand is calling on the graveyard of indian secularism and okay yeah Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I have a question. I, mean, I actually don't think my point is that you know it's too easy, and I'm not speaking this because you know I can speak in English or I went to to an, an English speaking school. I don't think it is simply a a, a matter of a, a, a particular liberal class. After all, today the the biggest warriors, certainly on social media, for Hindu nationalism and Hindutva, tend to be IIT uh, professionals. It's the engineers, okay. it's the scientists. So I don't think that this is about deracination at all yeah okay uh, i just wanted to make the point and then sadan uh, uh, go ahead and shruti can respond to my point later that in 1991 uh, the congress actually included the building of a mandir in its manifesto uh, indira gandhi as neerja choudhry's book so brilliantly captures mm-hmm. uh, uh, hinduized herself to the extent that the rss had a better relationship with her uh, than it did with atal bihari vajpay the congress has prevaricated on this issue has vacillated has played it both ways and we have to just park that and put that on the table because history documents that sadaran go ahead actually i'll come to you in a moment I think, i think we should discuss party politics but i don't think party okay. politics is the same as secularism before we okay. get into the party politics i just want to clarify a, a couple of things um i'm not pointing that i'm not saying that it was a great i'm not i wouldn't say call it a flaw in, in the project i would say that um the odds were always stacked against the kind of neruvian ne- ne- secularism prevailing in india because there was a sort of it just simply i'm just diagnosing what that soci- what society was versus what the aspirations were and i think the aspiration was unrealistic the flaw if you want me to talk about what i think the flaw in the indian the neruvian project is i think the big flaw of the neruvian project was a failure to extend the same modernizing zeal that was exhibited for example in the hindu code bills in the 1950s where Mo- where nehru did largely triumph uh or to the muslims and i think that ended up being the weak spot that gave us shabano that gave us the rushdi judgment that allowed advani to sort of to, to you know talk in those days you're absolutely right about pseudo secularism sort of he managed to point out the hypocrisy 
of the Indian liberal project. But that's not the argument I was making to start with. I was just saying that, look, you have a society that is deeply, deeply religious, right? This whole liberal idea, right, is based on the idea that the individual, individuals come together to form a society. The individual comes before the group. That is not, that is an idea that is not uh, sort of naturally accepted by many Indians, right? It's sort of, it's just, it's, it's, it's a foreign idea. Let's so say, I, want to, I want to clarify too. I, I want to clarify your position. This one quick thing about this idea of, 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 you know, there's some confusion about this, about this idea of English speaking and not. Um, of course, there are many IIT people and many people who speak perfect English who are votaries of Hindutva. But the fact is that the liberal project, the liberal constitution that you're talking about, Shruti, was written overwhelmingly by people who had exposure to the West and Western political ideas, including Ambedkar himself, right? There's two PhDs from the West. So these are ideas that are rooted in Western political thought. And you had a group of highly Westernized by Indian standards in terms of their education and exposure, uh, pe people who came together in a constituent assembly and came up with this, with this document. It doesn't mean that other people who speak English may not may have may not have different ideas. Obviously, Savarkar had a totally different idea. But the point is that the people who championed the liberal idea on in which Indian secularism or the Nehruvian secular project was rooted were overwhelmingly people I, who were of a uh, were, were, uh, I have a question. I have a question before. Sorry, I'm sorry. That, I, I, that at least basically has lost political power. It has lost a great deal of cultural power too. And that's just the reality of the country that you're, that, 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 that I, we're... I agree. I agree with the last part completely about losing both political and cultural power, about not having a language that, that much of your own country understands. But is it your argument, Sadhanan, and then I'll take come to you, Shruti. Is it your argument that the very idea of Nehruvian secularism was a flawed one, given the enormous religiosity or, and, and the intertwining of religion and culture in a country such as ours? Or is it your argument that the corrosion of the model was the problem, setting up then a counter movement to say you don't apply uh, reform zeal to Islam, uh, there is minority appeasement, there is Shahabano. So is it the corrosion of the principle? Which one is it? Good question. So I don't think of it as a, as flawed in normative terms, right? I think it's, a, it's an idea that I find, I find secularism attractive as an idea, right? I'm just saying that given the nature of Indian society, it was always going to be really tough to pull this off, right? So I have some sympathy for the people who tried to pull it off. It was always going to be tough. And I think that one of the big mistakes they made was putting the, the emphasis on this on the Hindu majority. And again, they did it with good reasons. I don't think these were people of ill will. And I think that perhaps if they had extended that same zeal, for example, in the 1950s, when you had the Hindu reform bills, if they had extended that same, so the, you know, that, that same modernizing impulse to Muslim personal laws, for example, if we'd had a uniform civil court, if you had not opened the sort of opened the door to the Advani pseudo secularism argument by so obviously and blatantly pandering to the most fundamentalist elements in Islamic society, maybe they would have pulled this off. I think the odds were always against it. But maybe the, it would have been, it could have been pulled off. But to start with the odds against you and then make the blunder of emphasizing this form of secularism for only one community and not for the other major community, that was the death knell. And that's where, how we've ended up where we are. I think uh, I would like to disagree with this narrative for two reasons. One, the Hindu code bill was a failure in, in, in the 1950s. Ambedkar lost his career for it. So in the sense that you don't get the reform of the Hindu of the Hindu personal law, please let me finish. Well, you, actually you, the 80s, the, you'll have to let me finish till till actually the 80s. And so it's actually been a really tough ride for Hindu reformers to get women parity on 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 on, 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 on the on the personal bill. Secondly, I think it has everything to do not with the Muslim question alone. Very much like the partition movement, it has everything to do with triangulated with caste. So you have from the 70s onwards a real rise of the other backward caste, a desire for greater recognition from the state for entitlements for reservations 
nations. And that is really the context in which Hindu majoritarianism first emerges as a political reality. I cannot be, I'm not like a, a British anthropologist who is going to say, like Sadaran is saying, you know, whether Indians are more religious or not. I mean, I, who is to say? I mean, I'm, I can only, you know, contextualize and say that actually in the last 30 years, you have seen an expansion. In, in my lifetime, you've seen an expansion of, as it were, religious public affairs. I mean, you know, whether it is Karva Chauth, whether it is a small religious festival to the temple. This is not this this did not just exist in my childhood. This kind of public re religiosity is coming on the back of a political movement, and it is a political movement which is trying to assert itself also socially. So the, okay, the, the, I have a question. I have so a question. I'm sorry, I... but like, from partition onwards, it has always been cast Muslim minority and the question of as it were the so-called Indian majority, and that's where where the debate has been. So okay, I do have, a, have, have, a, have a second, have a second. I know Sadhana wants to come in, but I have a question. I think the point is not uh, that, you know, that, that the Hindu reform bill didn't go as far as Nehru would have wanted it to and so on. It didn't go anywhere. The point, the point that Sadhana is making is that a, a, a basic principle like equal laws for all, equal laws for all, some universal family laws for all across religions. Yeah, so we did have a special, yeah, we do have a special marriage act. We do have a civil code which allows people to opt out of their, 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 their religious structure. Now, you the, the, the question is, if you're going to go back to the partition story and as it were, the constituent assembly debates, the issue really is that in, in those de debates, the idea is that the Muslims have exhausted the, 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 the seems to be the case that you know that they've exhausted their quota of political rights after partition so they will get a bunch of cultural rights they can they will get the right to kind of you know profess their own religion to regulate their own religion after all what is personal law yeah it is basically that you regulate your own religion just the way the hindus have wanted it and in fact it's the hindu it's the hindu reform it's the hindu conservatives who fight this off first and foremost uh, and and so these debates okay. have been ongoing if you wanted to have an equality but india was never precisely because you know there has been no distinction between politics and religion in this country you could never have had just a uniform civil code which would have also denied let's not let's not let's not forget it would have also denied the hindu undivided family its special rights Oh, Which absolutely. Oh, one, 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 one minute. One, one minute. One minute, Shruti. Of course, a uniform civil code will not just impact Muslims and Christians. It will impact multiple customs within the Hindu community. No one is making that point. I think, Sadhana, I'll let you make your own point. Go ahead. So just two things, right? I mean, if, if Shruti is saying that, you know, Shruti's point is that the Hindu code bill did not go as far. It didn't as... go at all anywhere. Okay, okay. Now let him speak. And... Now let him speak. Yeah. Right? Uh, the outlawing of polygamy happened through the Hindu code bill. The marriage age for for Hindu women was raised. There were real concrete things. There were concrete changes. I think there were good changes. There were positive changes, but they were made through the Hindu code bills in the 1950s. So the idea that nothing happened is just simply wrong. I mean, it's just wrong on the facts. You could argue that not as much happened as you would have liked to see. That's a separate debate. But you can't say that nothing happened, right? Um, the idea behind not meddling with Muslim personal law, I understand what the logic was in the 1950s. I think it was a mistake. And I think the mistake was manifested very vividly for many, most people or for many people by the 1980s. Because by the 1980s, we had reached a point where this idea of self-regulation was first of all being championed by the most uh, fundamentalist elements of the Muslim community. And secondly, it was not just sort of, it was impinging on people of other communities. For example, why was it okay that, I mean, I could read Midnight's Children, I could read Shame, why couldn't I read the Satanic Verses, right? So it wasn't something that was entirely internal, right? It was something that, that had implications for other people. Um, they lost the plot. And I think that if they had gone down a different route and they had demanded the sort of same level of secularization, so to speak, of all communities, maybe the project would have had a better chance of succeeding. Yes, I, I, let me just concede one thing or concede or rather can put it in a slightly different way, that the way Indian secularism has unfolded and this is, is really about the regulation of religion. 
It is not really and and regulation of religion and politics. It hasn't really been about policing of boundaries. And and in fact, all religious groups have looked to the Indian state for recognition, where recognition of their special rights. And I think that makes it a slightly different kettle of fish. And I don't want to go back to all of that because secularism, to be fair, to be to, in all honesty, seems dead today. And so I want to talk about something else, which Sadhanand is mentioning and which is really at the crux of it all, which is really when you have, as it were, the second age of democracy in India from the 80s onwards. And I think the 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 passing of the ordinance against Shahabano, you know, that was really the turning point in India. And I think it was a mistake. It was a mistake yeah. in every respect. It was a mistake above all for the Congress because it has never really recovered from it ideologically or electorally. So I definitely, you know, I think we can all agree that that yeah. is a turning point in Indian, Indian politics for various reasons. And, for, and they were, you know, and I think, you know, this is also happening in the American political debate. If you see, you know, the anti-Trump, you know, do you want to kind of critique, you know, who do you want to critique? Who do you want to, where do you want to blame? What, what is to be blamed? I'm not interested in the blame game. I'm interested in how Indian democracy now is unfolding. For, to, to me, actually, 60 years was a big, long run for Nehruvian secularism, particularly post-partition. I think India did pretty well as much as it could, holding a, you know, or, or, you know, putting and actually prosecuting a very bold rights-based, individual-based uh, constitution. And I hope it will stay. Uh, you know, group rights have uh, quite rightly prevailed, whether it is caste, whether it is uh, religion. I think now the question really is, how do you create an opposition to this? I think that's really, if, if, if a political opposition, I don't mean, you know, is it like, how do you, is it even, a, you know, because it seems to be so powerful and it has emerged only in 30 years. I mean, this electorally, it has had a very short run. And in, and, and it, what is, what, if anything, can be made of Indian pluralism as a political doctrine? Can it even, does it even have a political life? Or so are we all to say, you know, we accept, you know, we accept a Hindu first polity is here and let's so get on. You, can, so you have used this phrase twice now in this conversation, Hindu first polity. Yeah. I want to ask Sadanand if he agrees with that, because let's put also on the table what the BJP's counter to that description would be. Their, their counter would be that policies do not discriminate. The law doesn't discriminate. Welfare schemes do not discriminate. Uh, there is no there is no law slash policy of, of the Indian state that discriminates on the basis of religion. When Shruti calls it a Hindu first polity, do you agree? I do largely agree, right? I mean, you could argue that, I mean, it's great that they're not, you know, they're not discriminating in terms of, you know, gas cylinders or, or toilets and so on. But you could argue that, you know, I mean, that in terms of optics, um, it's very, very clear that one religious community is privileged in a very, in a, and in a, in a, in a very obvious and uh, blatant way. Um, I think it's also obvious that if you look at representation, for example, right? I mean, this is sort of an, in a country that is almost fifteen percent Muslim, to not have Muslim representation in the cabinet or not even have Muslim representation in the Lok Sabha for the ruling party, um, it it does it, it does suggest a Hindu first polity. Now you could argue that. You know, maybe it's not entirely Hindu first, and you know there are as there are there are elements of it where there is no discrimination. Fair enough, but I think it's sort of there is a difference, right? There is a rupture, there is a break. You have never had any cabinet in Indian history until this point where there wasn't Muslim representation. Go back all the way to you know to to Nehru's first cabinets, and there was a sense that. Look, but it's not as if just to just to be contrarian there, it's not as if if for example tomorrow Modi's cabinet had three Muslim ministers that you would be making a different argument, you'd then call them Sarkari Muslim, you know, no. the, 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 the biography, I, oh. the biography of, just what, let me get a question in, the biography of uh, Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah, uh, Nasiruddin Shah's brother, incidentally, but one of the highest ranking military officers, he called his own memoirs a Sarkari, Sarkari, Muslim, Sarkari Musliman. His point was, and he was one of the Muslim community members who went to meet with the RSS chief Mohan Bhagwan. His point was that this is the phrase that is used as a pejorative for any Muslim that tries to engage with the BJP and the BJP establishment. Parkha, it is true that a certain kind of hard left secularist would do that. But I would never say that. I think one of the sort of smartest things that Vajpayee did, for example, was making Abdul Kalam president. That was a yeah. sort of attempt to come up with an 
alternative version of pluralism to the Nehruvian version. But nonetheless, it's sort of some, there was some kind of serious engagement with the idea that you need an element of pluralism. And one element of pluralism is representation. So um, I'm, I don't have a problem with, uh, you know, with Shruti using the, uh, using the term Hindu first. But, you know, she talked about sort of contemporary politics. And I think this would be a good sort of segue to that. Yeah. Um, that what, what you're seeing in the opposition is a failure to learn from the mistakes of the past. Um, mm -hmm. They're making the same mistake again. It's not as though they have sort of gone back to the drawing board and figured out that, look, here is how we put forward a program of pluralism that embraces the fact that, you know, India is a country with sort of people of, uh, you know, many different religions living together. Uh, <coughs> Their, their playbook is essentially, I mean, they're confused, of course, right? Sort of one day yeah. they're going to people and then the other day they're sort of, you know, boycotting the, the, the ceremony in Ayodhya and so on. But they're, they're, it, what exactly is their philosophy, right? And I think on many of these questions, right, whether if you sort of look at, for example, the, the hijab debate, that's a debate we've had over here, you find that the Congress party instinctively again and again finds itself on the side of the most fundamentalist and the most conservative elements of the Indian Muslim community. I think this is a big mistake. It's a mistake they made in the 80s. It's a mistake they made in the 90s. It's a mistake they're making again. So let's for one moment, and I know Shruti, just, 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 just one, one moment. Let's pick up the hijab debate. Let's pick up the hijab debate. Those who supported the right and, and the Congress won Karnataka and it has actually changed the rules that the BJP tried to bring in. Karnataka was a state with this debate unfolded. Can you wear a hijab? To, a, to, to an educational institution, should you have hijabs in the classroom, right? The argument might be made today that if you can have such a visible display of Hindu religiosity, uh, you should also be able to have a public visible display of Muslim religiosity. To be clear, to be clear, I am... I am not a fan of the hijab for feminist reasons. I don't like any custom that demands of women greater the political question. Today, can you really talk about namaz on the streets or hijab in the classroom, given the public displays of Hindu sentiment that are now mainstream? So, I mean, I think... Like, Sadhanand and then you, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think, I mean, at, at, an, at an intellectual level, um, I certainly yeah. case, you know, the, the purely secular case um, is weakened by the sort of, you know, rise of very overt uh, Hindu religiosity. You're absolutely right. But at the political level, it doesn't change the argument at all. The politics of this is how does Congress find a way back to power? Can it find a way back to power basically by playing the same script that it used to play? And that script basically relies on uh, the most fundamentalist and the most conservative elements um, of the Muslim community. Now, you could argue that this is just where the Muslim community is right now. And maybe that was, that is right. Maybe you have a sort of, maybe that's where the energy lies. Maybe most people are sort of, you know, would, you know, see the hijab as a, some kind of, anyway, as, as a religious right. And maybe the rise of Hindutva has actually exacerbated that, right? By reducing the space for liberalism within the Muslim community. I think all those things are true, but it doesn't change the fact that in the public eye, Congress is identified as being associated not just with Indian Muslims, the vast majority of whom are moderate, but with the most retrograde elements of the Indian Muslim community. And that's something that hurts them politically. Now, whether or not the sort of there's a, there's a stronger intellectual case to be made for that today. I, than, think that's a, I think that's a very important point that politics. It, it still hurts them, in my view. Okay, Shruti, I think that I'll add so a question. I, mean, I want to say a couple of things. Can I, can, can I add just a minor question of my own? Mm -hmm. I think Sadanand is, is right in distinguishing between uh, an esoteric, academic, intellectual, journalistic conversation and what a political party must grapple with. A.K. Antony, no less, uh, brought out a report that spoke about the perception of the Congress as an anti-Hindu party, right? This is Mr. Antony, a congressman whose son has since joined the BJP. Uh, Sadhanand makes the important point that there's no point talking about theoret about change when it's just theory. You can't you can't bring change till you win elections. You can't bring change till you till, till you actually have the power to influence change. And to that extent, this calls for some tactical and strategic shifts. Also, 
It's not clear what your ideology is because your chief minister in Himachal Pradesh has declared a full day off. Your ally in Delhi is leading Hanuman parts across 70 seats. Your other ally in Maharashtra, Uddhav Thakre, is talking about being a one crore contributor when he was Maharashtra chief minister as a Ram Bhats to the Mandir Trust. And your other ally, Udhiridhi Stalin, is pulling you in completely the other direction. The point is the Congress at the moment can't claim ideological inclusiveness or Nehruvian secularism, because it isn't even playing from that playbook? Uh, possibly, yes. I mean, I think a couple of things. I don't think the hijab question is the touchstone of India's secularism. I think one of the mistakes we have always constantly made is really made the question of Indian secularism about the Muslim minority, though, of course, that is that is there. I mean, I keep saying this. I mean, the triangulation has to be with, with the caste question, which is also a minority question, and how that is getting reasserted. On that, I want to say whether it is a question of religion or whether it is a question of caste. The BJP has created a new social and political engineering where you are getting a uniformity incorporation in uniformity i will not be surprised tomorrow that you know you it might even have you know muslim uh, representation in parliament back you know you already have a vice president the former vice chancellor of amu has been made a vice president or part of the executive of the bjp so you know even and you know das gupta said on your show that you know that's what needs to be done having said all of that that's not where it's at the story is to create a new very aggressive identity for what it means to be an indian today and i think that's where the question is about nationalism and not simply about a hindu first politic polity and i think this is where the opposition has missed a really major problem, a major issue. I'm that glad you brought up nationalism because yes, the, Congress I, is, I the opposition I mean, has completely ceded that space completely yes, to the right. So the and precisely because something like the Congress was was as it was synonymous with the freedom of India, and you know it is you know and and it it is really the original nation building you know party, and to have ceded the question of nationalism is interesting. And so that same goes with liberalism. An argument can be made. I mean, I couldn't get the chance to say it. Whether it is the English language, whether it is cricket, whether it is liberalism, India remade these things in the light of its own culture and its own uh, own context. What has okay? It has ceded space. It has. It has. You know. It and in the same way, I think you know, Prime Minister Modi is is in my view reinventing or reformatting a particular form of a party state in India. So there are two leaders in this world today who have called the coming of a new era. One is, of course, uh, our Prime Minister uh, two days ago, uh, the Ram Temple inaugurating a new era. The other leader, of course, is Xi Jinping, who earlier this year called the inauguration also of a new era. So. You're seeing a shift in world politics, which is, of course, anti-Western. It is a rise of Asia. It is a rise of a neo-nationalism, which the BJP is prosecuting in two ways. One, by the internal making of India and its social fabric, which is based on an aggressive uniformity, and another, which is a projection of a strong India internationally. Now, the, the Congress, on the other hand, or whether it is the Congress or the opposition, has gotten fragmented because it is thinking of pluralism as a series of fragments. And that is a big problem. You know, whether it is federal, federalism, whether it is caste, it is uh, it is trying to this kind of fusionist, as it were, ideology, like very aggressive fusion that the BJP is demanding out of Indians is being countered by a series of fissures and, and fragment, fragmentation, which I'm afraid is not going to add up as we are seeing already with the India coalition. So yes, you need a counter definition. Okay. A counter let's, talk idea in the, let's talk in the last few moments of what that counter might look like. Is there a counter? Sadanand, you spoke about how the very idea of Nehruvian secularism and its detachment uh, was unworkable. Uh, liberals today are quoting Mahatma Gandhi. Liberals today are quoting Mahatma Gandhi as an example of an alternative. I'll quote something that I've reported on the Indian military. The Indian military has actually perfected, in my understanding, a contemporary model of pluralism. It's, of course, nationalist credentials can't be questioned. But it is perfectly common, depending on the regiment, for a Muslim commanding officer to lead an arti or for a Hindu commanding officer uh, to, to basically lead namaz. I have seen this ha happen ag again and again and again while reporting the military. Is that the, is that the counter narrative? Nationalism plus syncreticism? And is the mistake the opposition made to miss both nationalism and talk about tolerance, not actual participation. 
I mean, I don't know what the answer is in religious terms, right? This is very complex, right? Even when Gandhi was trying this, uh, you know, with, you know, incorporating, you know, Ishwar Allah, Tere Naam and all in his bhajans. I mean, you know, it was very, it had very limited success if you look at its purchase among the Muslim population, right? They had some sort of Muslims who came to Congress, but by and large, right, if you sort of look, for example, at, I mean, why was the Muslim League so wildly successful? Um, in part because that that kind of syncretism didn't really necessarily play well with everyone. So I don't know what the sort of whether syncretism is going to get you to that point. My own preference obviously would be, I actually am a, I'm a believer in old fashioned liberalism, where I think that you have to accept that different faiths, you know, view things very differently and the state should sort of stay above it all um, and, and not take sides. But then and, would you support a uniform civil code? I absolutely would support a uniform civil code. And is that a contradictory statement you just made there? How? You said that you believe that every community will interpret their faith in their own way. And largely the state should remain far away from interpreting that faith or policing it or guiding it or steering it. A uniform civil code, which I support too, by the way, huh. uh, would do precisely that. Yeah. So, I mean, let's that's just take an example, right? Take any Western democracy. You have a set of laws that apply uniformly to everybody. And then within that, you don't sort of, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not trying to fight off force the fusion of Christianity and Hinduism or Christianity and Islam and so on. So, but the fact is that you have a certain set of laws and they have to apply equally to everyone. You can't have sort of separate laws of divorce for divorce, separate laws for marriage, separate laws for inheritance, as you have in India. So I think it's perfectly compatible. You can have a uniform civil code because that is the basic sort of the basic liberal principle. And this is where I think, you know, the Nehruvian project stumbled. But at the same time, you don't have the state that's sort of getting so deeply involved in religious affairs and saying that we're, you know, we're going to try and invent this new kind of syncretism. Um, the fact is that you're going to have to come up with some form. Of, a plural, pluralism has to be central to India. No serious country, right, where one out of five people is not Hindu. No serious country can sort of hope to progress unless it has come to terms with, some, with, 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 its, with the reality of its population. Um, I'm a critic of sort of the Nehruvian project. I think they blundered. That doesn't necessarily mean that I think that the current regime is doing a good job. I think they're doing an awful job, right? So the question is, how do you come to this? Will the BJP come to this by, you know, sort of softening itself on the edges, incorporating more liberal principles, being more inclusive of people of, you know, of uh, Indian Muslims and Christians? That would be fantastic. Um, or will the Congress reinvent itself and do it in a way while acknowledging the fact that, you know, the reality of Indian politics is that this is a deeply religious country and Hindus are deeply religious and that, that sort of that, that and that the old elite who were much less religious um, have really lost power. Um, they've lost political power. They've lost most of their cultural power and sort of readjust themselves to this new reality. Um, I think their future depends on that. I don't really see them. Uh, with sort of uh, adjusting to these new realities. And so I think the best bet for Indian pluralism going ahead would be to see a kind of uh, a, a more sophisticated form of thinking coming from within the BJP. So I'm hoping that that will happen. Yes, Ashuti, that's a very interesting question. Will the BJP soften its edges or will the Congress-led opposition change? I tend to agree with Sadanand. We don't know. We're all guessing. But if Modi does take a third term, as is now believed to be pretty much uh, a given, uh, you know, there is a very interesting outreach happening with Paswanda Muslims in Uttar Pradesh. There was a meeting with Christian leaders uh, on Christmas. We don't know. Uh, but to Sadanand's central question, does the counter come from within the BJP or does it come from the opposition? Uh, and what does that what does the new model of pluralism look like? And don't you need a language of faith to actually talk no, about? Actually, faith? I would like to put it slightly differently because I think people have faith and whether they're in the Congress or otherwise, and you know, they display it as and when. I think the the, the challenge is something else, which is that extreme ideas, uh, whether they're right wing, particularly right wing, uh, they incite emotion and identification. You know, they, 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 they galvanize people psychically. And that's really what has happened in the last 10 years, a muscular India, a muscular nation, a Hindu first. And, you know, this is a real problem actually for the opposition. Because something like the constitutional value you know, that they, they want to protect, constitutional values, this seems all too, as it were, I would say, like 
pika. Like, you know, it feels like emotionally not very charged. And so how do you kind of create a new psychic emotive map? And I think this is... You, need, you need a good story. At least yeah, you need but, a good but story. That was, also that was also Gandhi's uh, answer because this is why Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi did so well because he actually kind of made things like patience and, you know, very, very kind of like boring sentiments uh, kind of, uh, you know, had a lot of traction. And I think that's the missing link uh, in some ways, that you need a kind of pluralism or a kind of, uh, yeah, a, a plural, uh, the idea of a plural in there, which is both strong and which, in fact, incites emotions and pride. We should be also, we should, ha we should have, uh, we should have pride in the history that actually at the very device, divisive moment of partition, India held its nerve and became a secular polity at, at the very moment that its borders were, you know, partitioned on the basis of religion. Right. I mean, yeah. these are things to be incredibly proud of rather than, you know, and, and I think so I think there are issues around how pride is now co uh, uh, constituted. And I don't agree with, uh, the, the, though that might be the most pragmatic answer that Dhume gives. I think the BJP is also caught up in its own uh, versions of extremism. You have, you know, it's an insatiable uh, right on its side as well. You know, you've now had the Ram Temple, then it's going to be Kashi, then it's going to be Mathura. You know, you literally had Bhagwat, you know, the chief of, of the RSS saying, please don't think every mosque has a shivling underneath it. Right. He is trying to discipline what is now an insatiable passion, which has been actually unleashed in, 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 in India. So I think they have their task cut out too. Uh, Prime Minister okay. Modi's speech was, no, I want to finish that. I don't think this moderation is going to come, uh, come easily. In fact, it will be the biggest challenge for the BJP in the third term whether it goes. And I think if you speak to BJP ideologues, they will th themselves say they don't have an answer. Uh, you know, you will actually, they, you know, they, there'd be some who would want it to be a bit more centrist, a bit more liberal, uh, and others who, as, as I said, its constituency is going to demand more and more uh, such exclusive policies. And that is, I think, uh, you know, okay. that's where okay, it's let me let me just give Sadan in the brief closing word with picking up on what you said. Uh, it's true that both the RSS chief who, who spoke about Hosh with Josh and the prime minister who spoke about uh, Vijay with Vinay, decency with victory in a moment of, of, of victory are trying to indeed, I think, tell the base that this cannot be an endless, the, you know, there has to be a, the proverbial Lakshman Rekha that is drawn somewhere. Maybe it ends with Kashi and Mathura. I don't know. That will be decided in the courts. But Sadhana, there is some argument you hear from BGP ideologues who say that countries like the United States of America, where you are today, or countries like the United Kingdom, where Shruti is today, uh, have, have, have been shaped by Christian values, the politics, uh, the culture, the subculture, uh, without diminishing their diversity. And there could be people in the BJP who would argue that it is possible to, to recognize and acknowledge and celebrate uh, a sort of uh, the Hindu majority and its sentiments without diminishing the minorities. And they would point westwards to make that argument. So last word to you on that question or that point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's theoretically possible. I'm not sort of, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to dismiss it, uh, you know, out of hand. And it's certainly true that even liberalism, right? I mean, the many scholars have written about this. Um, in many ways, the central core concept of liberalism which is that the individual comes before the group, um, is something that's derived from a Christian worldview, right? So, I mean, there are sort of, uh, you know, we, I, I happen to think it's a universal principle that, can, that, that travels well, but many people would argue that it's a principle that really works most properly in countries that have been steeped in a Christian tradition, even if they're post-Christian now. So I, I, I'm, I, I would love to see uh, this put into effect. I would love to see evidence that you can come up with a set of principles that um, allow the flourishing of people of all faiths in India while celebrating uh, Hinduism and the beauties of Hinduism. Uh, all I would say is that I'm a little bit skeptical based on the evidence so far. And I think I have reason to be skeptical. I don't see uh, what we've seen over the last 10 years. I don't really see a lot of evidence of people trying to make room or trying to create a new form of pluralism that is, you know, as respectful and uh, as open and warm uh, toward people of other faiths um, and is sort of rooted in the idea that they're going to have 
equal legal rights and so on. So um, I'd like to see how what this experiment um, comes up with. I would and I would love it to be sort of you know gentler and more inclu inclusive. But for now, I have to say that the you know principles that seem to have worked so far best for human beings are liberal principles. And so it's on the the onus is on the Hindu nationalists. The onus is on the BJP to prove that they can come up with an alternative that doesn't just make them happy, right? The litmus test is that will Muslims say that? Oh, you know, look, this is a this is a this is a better system. Um, and so far, we haven't seen evidence of that, in my view. Okay, many questions, no easy answers. Uh, I think the one takeaway that we can probably all three of us agree on is that there is no conversation of pluralism possible without an accompanying. Uh, partner conversation about nationalism. And I think the wedge uh, intellectually that has been driven, uh, especially by, I would, this is me saying, not on behalf of both of you, uh, those on the left uh, for the Congress party in particular has possibly done it political damage, but this is a conversation that goes beyond elections. Uh, this is India in the making, some would say India in the remaking, and uh, it's easy for us to talk much tougher for those uh, who actually have to find a political language, in, uh, a language of mass mobilization that is different today from the very successful language of the BJP. Thank you, Shruti and Sadhana. It's been a fascinating Thank conversation. You. Take care and see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Mojo Story has always made a commitment to its viewers to go to where the story is. And as you can see here, we are at the epicenter of the Israel war on Gaza. We are right at the front line, about one mile from the Gaza Strip, as is the Israeli military gets ready with its tanks and its gunners to begin its final frontal assault that will take troops into Gaza. As we said, we are not like other organizations. We believe in giving you all sides of the story objectively and as much as possible from the ground. And that's exactly what we're doing here, covering the biggest global story today from the epicenter of the war zone. So please, we need your support. Support us, become a Mojo member, subscribe to us, spread the word and thank you for your support.